Hello, Mike Cook here, and welcome to another edition of Anti-Doping Updates. This is episode 12, and we've got three great stories to talk about today. First is a Kenyan distance runner who argued that his positive test was the result of pork fat. Second, we've got another Kenyan distance runner who tried to dodge an unannounced out of competition test. And third, we've got an Australian Paralympic power lifter who tested positive and tried to argue that, her, um, that she should be allowed a therapeutic use exemption. All right, let's get started. So the first story to talk about is James Kivett. He is a, a long distance runner from Kenya. He's ranked 133rd in the world with a personal best in the 10K of 28 minutes and 23 seconds. In November of 2019, he submitted an in-competition urine sample for testing at the Corsa dei Santi in Rome, Italy. That's a world athletics competition and he placed third in the competition. The sample tested positive for 19NA and 19NE, which are both metabolites of nandrolone. And nandrolone is an exogenous anabolic androgenic steroid prohibited at all times by the World Anti-Doping Code. Um, World Athletics has delegated its results management authority to the Athletics Integrity Unit. And in December of 2019, the Athletics Integrity Unit sent Mr. Kivett a notice of charge that he tested positive for nandrolone um, metabolites. And Kivett responded that he believed his um, positive test was the result of pork fat that he consumed. The AIU rejected that explanation, issued a notice of charge suspending him for four years, and they also provided him with information on how to get the substance tested to, if you wanted to try to prove his case that his pork fat was the result of his, um, resulted in a positive test. Kibbit requested a hearing, which the Athletics Integrity Unit referred to Sport Resolutions, which is a um, agency in London that does uh, international sports arbitration. A hearing was scheduled for December 2020, but prior to the hearing, Kibbit informed the panel that he was not going to appear and wanted the, the panel to make a decision based on the documentary evidence. He had admitted the anti-doping violation, but argued that his four-year sanction should be reduced due to no fault or negligence or no significant fault or negligence. Sport resolutions in deciding this case found that um, Kivett had not proved that he purchased pork fat, had not proved that fat or pork oil contained nandrolone, or that the pork fat resulted in the positive test. So they rejected his defense and found that since he hadn't shown how uh, his positive uh, test resulted, then there is no basis other than to conclude that it was an intentional violation, and so he's subject to a four-year sanction. Okay, second story is, an is also a long-distance runner, James Kivik Chulio Kendagar. He's a long-distance runner from Kenya, ranked 277th in the world in the marathon with a personal best of two hours and seven minutes. He's also maybe a potato farmer, but more on that later. So in, on November 21, 2018, a, a doping control officer and a blood collecting officer went to Mr. Kendigar's home in Eldoret, Kenya to collect samples for testing for the athlete biological passport. Eldoret is the fifth largest city in Kenya. It's at high altitude, about 5,000 or 7,000 to 9,000 feet. And there's been many Kenyan runners uh, coming from that area and they have a monument in the town uh, honoring the successful Kenyan runners. It's, there's only 475,000 people that live there, but a lot of Kenyan runners have come from that area. The doping control officer and the blood control officer found the individual that they believed to be Mr. Kedegar, but this person said he was not. He said he was a Mr. Chepkwami. Mr. Chepkwani said that Mr. Kendagar had gone to his potato farm 
to harvest potatoes. And there was also a small girl who was clinging on to Mr. Chepkwani's leg. Um, and Mr. Chepkwani told the doping control officers and the blood control officer that um, he had retired from athletics three years ago and he refused to be uh, tested. So the DCO and the BCO did an internet search, found photographs, and then they realized that this person who was saying that he was Mr. Chepkwani was actually Mr. Kedegar um, that they were trying to test. Uh, they still weren't able to test him and uh, issued their report. The Athletics Integrity Unit it, it handles the disciplinary cases for World Athletics, and based on the DCO's report, they issued a notice of charge can, contending that Mr. Kedegar had committed an anti-doping rule violation by refusing to submit a sample for testing. Mr. Kedegar requested a hearing before the Athletics Integrity Unit, and at the hearing, Mr. Kedegar produced five witnesses, all of whom were friends and either friends, relatives, or neighbors, and they all held up his story that Mr. Kedegar was not at home on uh, November 21, that he was at his potato farm for his harvest. The Athletics Integrity Unit noted that there was some discrepancy among the various witnesses' testimony, but nevertheless, they believed that story that it was not, that Mr. Kedegar was not at his home, um, and they found the statements plausible and dismissed the charges. World Athletics decided to appeal that decision to the Court for Arbitration of Sport. As is usual in Court for Arbitration of Sports proceedings, they held a de novo hearing. That means that each side has to present their evidence anew and not rely on evidence that was submitted in the prior uh, proceeding. Uh, despite this, Mr. Kedegar did not produce any of his witnesses, any of the five witnesses that he called before his Athletics Integrity Unit hearing. Um, he just relied on the, uh, the, the transcript of the proceeding. The Court for Arbitration of Sport found that the, that, uh, the record from AIU um, with Mr. Kedegar and his witnesses contained discrepancies that were not plausible. First, they found that it was not plausible that Mr. Kedegar would only arrange for going to his potato farm for the harvest the night before. Secondly, they found that it was not plausible um, uh, that the person was Mr. Chepkwani because Mr. Chepkwani refused to give his first name. He would only give his last name to the, the DCO and BCO. And thirdly, they found that it was not plausible that the individual was Mr. Chepkwani because of the young girl clinging to his leg. Uh, they found that, you know, based on the, on the record, Mr. Chepkwani did not have a daughter that Mr. Kedogar did. So they found that it was more likely than not it's actually Mr. Kedogar who is um, contacted by the DCO and BCO and refused to provide a sample. Given that, the Court for Arbitration of Sport found that World Athletics had proven its case and the sanction for refusing to provide a sample is a four-year sanction, is a four years if it's an intentional violation and the court found that this was an intentional violation and um, sanctioned him from four years. And they also fined him 1,000 Swiss francs, which is about 1,100 US dollars. So uh, a harsh sanction for Mr. Kedegar. Last case to talk about is Christine Ashcroft. Christine Ashcroft is a para powerlifter from Australia. She's also a retired Australian Army Corporal and was deployed to Afghanistan in 2010. She, in 2016, she appeared on the Australian version of The Voice, a singing show. She's also a breast cancer survivor and had a mastectomy and also a thy thyroidectomy and has a number of health conditions and treatments. Nevertheless, she's been able to compete at a high level in para power, powerlifting. She competed in the World 
Para Powerlifting World Cup in Dubai in 2017 and the Australian National Para Powerlifting Championships in Queensland in October of 2017 and the World Para Powerlifting Championships in Mexico City in December of 2017 and was selected to represent Australia in the Para Powerlifting at the 2018 Commonwealth Games which were held at the Gold Coast in Australia. Uh, in 2017, she submitted a therapeutic use exemption for oxycodone and tibolone and human growth hormone. The therapeutic use exemptions were approved for the oxycodone and the tibolone, but denied for the human growth hormone. In 2018, Ashkoff made a retroactive request for a therapeutic use exemption for uh, somatropin and testosterone but that was denied. In October of 2017, when she was competing at the uh, Australian Powerlifting Championships, which was a selection event for the 2018 Commonwealth Games, she submitted a urine sample for her testing, and that tested positive for exogenous testosterone, androsterone, etiochlorinone, and 5-beta androstane and 17-beta diol. In February of 2018, she submitted an out-of-competition urine sample, which also tested positive for exogenous androsterone, etiochlorinone, and 5-beta androstane um, and 17-beta diol. Uh, all of those are uh, anabolic steroids prohibited at all times under the World Anti-Doping Code. Sport Integrity Australia is the anti-doping agency for Australia and notified Ashcroft of the violation and requested an interview as part of this violation. In her interview with Sport Integrity Australia, Ashcroft stated that in September of 2017, her general uh, practitioner position referred her to an endocrinologist who prescribed testosterone um, to treat chronic pain. She said she only received or, or pain uh, coming from after her thyroid surgery. She said she only received one injection and about two weeks prior to the sample, which was two weeks prior to the sample collection. And in the same interview, she said she, she admitted to trying human growth hormone, but just for seven days. So that was her admission. She said uh, only one injection and only tried HGH for seven days. But when Sport Integrity Australia investigated the case, they found records from the pharmacy that Ashcroft used that showed she had two prescriptions for testosterone in August 2017 and December 2017, and 10 prescriptions for HGH from September 2016 to July 2017. Uh, so quite a bit more than what she admitted to in her investigation. Uh, they also, that's also part of the investigation. They found that Ashcroft had received and attended anti-doping education from Australia in 2017 and 2018. And they found text messages that Ashcroft had with her former coach that said, let's start HGH together and push it big time. So that's what she was communicating with her coach at the time. They also found that uh, there's correspondence from from Ashcroft's doctor that said that they would use small doses of testosterone in 2017 to treat discomfort and elevate thyroid function. So Sport Integrity Australia and Powerlifting Australia charged Ashcroft with presence, use, and possession of prohibited substances. She, Ashcroft requested a hearing, which was referred to the National Sports Tribunal for a hearing. So the first issue is whether this should be considered one violation or two violations, given that we have the, um, the two samples. We've got the, the uh, in-competition sample from October of 2017 and the out-of-competition sample from February of 2018. And this situation happens um, quite frequently because it takes some time for the, um, the process just to go through. Um, and the World Anti-Doping Code addresses this 
and says that if the second violation happened before the individual received notification of the first violation, then it's all just treated as one violation and the sanction is whichever one is greater. Uh, so the, the results management authority will, will look at both, both samples and figure out what's the sanction for, for both of them. So the next issue is whether or not this can be, it, this is considered an intentional violation, which is subject to four years sanction, or an unintentional violation, which is subject to two years with a possibility for being reduced due to no fault or negligence or no significant fault or negligence. And the last issue to look at is whether or not the sanction can be reduced due to the athlete's prompt admission. That was one of um, Ashcroft's arguments. So intentional in terms of the World Anti-Doping Code for presence, use, or possession means the athlete engaged in conduct which she knew constituted an anti-doping rule violation or knew that there was a significant risk that the conduct might contact it, that, that the conduct might uh, constitute an anti-doping rule violation and manifestly disregarded the risk. Ashcroft argued that her violations should be considered, um, should not be considered intentional because she had a prescription for testosterone and there was a therapeutic use for that, namely the, um, namely reducing pain after her thyroid surgery, rather than a performance enhancing use for the testosterone. She also argued that the National Sports Tribunal should consider her physical and mental health conditions, such as depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, brain in injury, de deafness, and she argued that she was recovering from a lengthy battle with thyroid cancer, had cervical spine injuries, and injuries to her right shoulder. In deciding this case, the National Sports Tribunal noted that Ashcroft was an experienced international competitor. She's competed in Doha, in Mexico City, and in national and international competitions representing Australia. And had made applications for therapeutic use exemptions and had received anti-doping education. Given these findings, the National Sports Tribunal concluded that the violation was intentional and therefore there's no opportunity for reduction of sanction based on no fault or negligence or no significant fault or negligence. So the next issue was whether or not the, the four-year sanction can be reduced due to the athlete's prompt admission. Uh, and Ashcroft argued that she made a prompt admission in her, um, when she was interviewed by Sport Integrity Australia. And here, the NST found that Ashcroft had only made partial admissions. Ashcroft stated she'd only received one injection for testosterone and a seven-day trial of HGH when the pharmacy records and the text messages and the correspondence with her doctor showed that she'd used testosterone for, and HGH for a much longer period than what she had admitted to. Um, therefore, the National Sports Tribunal found that, that, that a partial uh, and disingenuous admission was not a prompt admission of guilt, and therefore d declined to reduce the sanction from four years. So Ashcroft is, Christine Ashcroft is sanctioned for four years. And also, um, her results, because this is a possession case, and she admitted to possessing HGH all the way back to 2016, all of her results from 2016 and um, until the date of the hearing, all those are disqualified. So all of her, her records and medals are, are disqualified going back that far. That's it for anti-doping updates for this week. Next week, I'll be back with some more exciting cases. And wherever you are in the world, I hope you're having a great day.